So the, like the um, reflecting on Vipaka Kama, uh, this is I found very useful. I, like at this moment, uh, here and now, for each other, this is the Vipaka Kama we're experiencing. So, mm-hmm. you know, physically, the way you're feeling, uh, mentally, whatever it is, it's what they call resultant karma. And uh, Kama Vipaka in Thai. And so that, this is, because there's always the, this uh, Pachubana Dhamma, the, the reality of here and now, and uh, and then we, you know, we're conditioned to to not really give the present moment that much attention unless there's something, you know, like your life is in danger or there's something forcing you to pay attention in the present. But so much of our life is lived in planning for the future or looking forward to something or or <coughs> remembering the past and then the present moment is uh, can be ignored or dismissed or not consciously ad- admitted into thought even though it, that's where life takes place is always in the present and you know, this uh, timelessness uh, um, Akalika Dhamma is uh, important to to contemplate, you know, in the uh, and that all there is is, is the here and now. The, there's no future and there's no past. But so then you reflect right now. Uh, you know, this is the body's like this. So the sitting posture. Uh, the breathing, and this is the result of birth, you know, in the past, and then the, and then the feeling, particular, you know, whether you're comfortable or painful, feel sick or healthy or relaxed or tense or whatever is the Parker comma that you 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 can recognize, paying attention to posture, like the four postures. Sitting, standing, walking, lying down. That covers the movement of the body through the day and night. So your body is either in the, you know, in one part, moving, you know, in the posture and then moving from one to the other uh, uh, for a lifetime, and then the breathing and the like uh, posture, the four postures, Iriabod, C, and the and the breathing on Anapanasati. Uh, are, you know, usually not fraught with a lot of personal identities. You know, they, they're quite, you know, it's physical and physiological, so it's, it's not, you know, we don't create a, a sense of our self-worth around, usually around sitting, standing, walking, or lying down, or breathing. So that's why, like, in basic meditation, when you start teaching somebody meditation, you start with the with the most obvious, you know, like the the posture and the breath, and just to give something that doesn't arouse a lot of uh, emotion or personal identity or that, because it's, it's fairly, you know, much the same for all of us. Sitting is just sitting. We can even form an ego around that that I sit better than you do, and I <laughs> but that's not the point, you know, not to have an idea of perfect posture and try to be the best sitter, but to just, even if you're not very good or, or sitting on a chair or whatever, <coughs> it's it's not to, you know, create an ego sense of what what is right and you're not as good as somebody else or you're better than somebody else, but just to pay attention to the actual reality and the experience of sitting is like this, standing, walking and lying down, breathing. And then the, the um, Lung Pa Cha was always, uh, his, what I found valuable with, in my early life with him was his emphasis on Chittanu Pasana. Uh, and so, 
this, the, like the third uh, uh, foundation of mindfulness, uh, because it was, you know, in, in the state I was in when I arrived at Wapapo, unable to to really speak the language or anything. I could, uh, you know, I got the point. I got the message quite early, you know, the value of looking at the state of mind. And uh, and so that's what I, I developed a lot of uh, Jitanu Pasana practice. In which it just, you know, with this Puto um, mantra. And then you, you take the like the the uh, Dhamma Santit Kawakaliko Ehi Pasko Upanaiko Bajatan Metinapo in Yuhi. So Lung Pacha would always you'd hear you know, you'd be chanting this morning evening puja and, and then you you'd uh, you know, you you kind of then it translated it into English or when I learned Thai then I, I learned you know, I could pick up the things in uh, first my the way I learned Theravada Buddhism was a kind of mixture of Pali, Thai, and English. It was, it was three languages all mixed together. So, uh, but uh, Akalika Dhamma, I spent a lot of time just contemplating that. Like, right now, at this very moment, this is the sitting and the breathing. And what is the future at this moment? You know, then I questioned myself. So what at this moment, tomorrow, nothing. Tomorrow's Christmas, of course. And what? But then, you know, in the reality of this moment, it's uh, it's you don't know. You know, it is. You know, you have this. It hasn't happened yet. You can't remember tomorrow. Uh, and but you have maybe expect something. It should you know? It shouldn't be like this. Or you dread maybe. Oh, the a lot of people or whatever your you know your tendency is to in, in just that perception of tomorrow or next year or whatever is, is is to be seen as as my now or uncertain or the unknown not knowing because it hasn't happened but what we do is we hope for the best or you know we maybe dread the worst things happening or or expect or or uh, fear anxiety worry arise around possibilities of success failure happiness and suffering in the future and then but that's seen always in the present you know the future the reality of the future right now is it's a perception it is what it is and and the feeling but it you don't. You can't remember it, so it's not like a memory. But it, it you do feel this tendency to hope everything will be all right, or expect, or dread, or or you're planning, or wanting something in the future, or hoping to you know get something or go somewhere. It's like this, and then, but that's in the present here and now. So you kind of. And then you have the same with the past. What is the past? Right now, if there's only the present, there's only here now, then what is the, the past at this very moment when we're sitting here? And then, you know, you have memory, you, re- you have memories of yesterday or going been about this morning. That's the past, that's a perception, a memory that you did something uh, you went on uh, to some place, went to Bungwai, on uh, Bindabak. What is that right now? It's a memory, and a memory, of course, is Anicca Dukkanata. Hope, expectation, fear and dread, and, and worry and anxiety are all conditions that arise in the present, the Vipaka Kamma. So more and more you you, you know, you recognize that it's in the present moment that there's liberation and freedom. And, you know, to keep thinking that you're, you're going to practice now to attain something in the future. What is that? You know, what is, what is that in the present? It's the hope, maybe. You know, 
I, I hope if I practice really hard now I will attain uh, insight in the future the reality of that very thought of perception is is uh, in the present and so you, you begin to notice it it is, it is what it is and, and that which is aware of it is uh, then this puto, this this knowing, this mindful knowing of Dhamma, of the way it is, of the Pachubana Dhamma, rather than, you know, operating always from the assumption that the future is where you're, you're going to be liberated or you're going to attain something. Or maybe you're a real pessimist. Maybe you think, oh, I'll probably never get anywhere. <laughs> As one's the Parker <laughs> and uh, uh, but it's always about the me in the, you know trying to hope or dread or something about possibilities, probabilities in the future, or in the past we can we feel maybe guilt or regret or that about things we've said or done in the past, or we have resentment. You know, how many of you carry resentments uh, from being treated unfairly or persecuted or misunderstood or misrepresented in the past? And so, or, or how many of you feel a lot of guilt about foolish things you've done or said in the past? And so then you're beginning to observe, like, memories. That's memory, isn't it? I did this dreadful thing in the past. That's a memory in the present. So then you have this butto tamo relationship of awareness with knowing reality, awakened consciousness of knowing, recognizing reality or dhamma in the present. So I like to use the English word reality for for dhamma. Well, you know, translate Dhamma into reality. So, say, awaken to the real, rather than... And so it's a matter of paying attention, of mindfulness in the present, rather than operating from the basic delusion of I've got to practice in order to become in the future. And so, like in... Uh, the paticca samupada, the dependent origination. You know, if you really study that, <coughs> contemplate that, you know, you've got the sequence of vicha bhajya sankara sankara bhajya vinyana. So then you, avicca is is the first one, you know, which means not understanding, not having you know, any insight into reality, into dhamma. <coughs> so if you take that whole sequence. It's always a vicha is the cause of suffering. You know, so you got if if you always operate from the present moment, even with practice and and meditation, all the good things, always from the sakya ditti level. That's a vicha, and so the result is going to always be dukkha, some form of doubt or despair or. Uh, disappointment in in yourself or in teachers or in traditions or practice. So then the the uh, the thing is to not not operate from a vicha. You know, so uh, you know, I determine not to not to try to create more avicca for for you you know by <clears throat> rather than you know trying to feed your ego or you know by telling you what I think of you or what you are where you're at uh, like which was always pointing getting me to look at myself rather than telling you know trying to uh, you know tell me my attainments or lack of them or abilities or lack of ability so this is uh, you know you so you, you feel this 
you know, because I would project onto Lumpur Cha, kind of, he's a high, he's a wise meditation master, enlightened teacher. He knows what I need, and and so you know, because that's how I felt when I arrived at Wat Pat Pong. I felt I was ignorant, unenlightened person who came to study, practice with an enlightened master, and so. That was how I started. That kind of initial. Uh, that was the beginning, in any way. In any way, the, so then my relationship with Lung Kwan Cha was one. At uh, first, was you know, you you're the wise teacher, and I'm the ignorant student. But Lung Kwan Cha never would promote that relationship, and so uh, I was quite willing to. You know. I, Really fell. Uh, my Vipaka Kama was one I wanted. I didn't trust myself. I tended to to think of myself as inadequate, and I wanted to give myself to you know the, to somebody wise who would tell me what to do. And so uh, you know this was this is how I related to Lumpur Cha at first, and and then through this Jitanu Pasana practice, he could get me to see what I was doing. It was very frustrating at first because I fully believed my scenario. You know, and everybody said, you know, Lung Po Cha's an enlightened master and you have to learn from him. So, And that's the, the mindset, the, the paradigm that, that it comes naturally to, to my conditioning. You know, the way I'm conditioned to see myself and and then project on somebody else like Ajahn Chah, he's kind of, uh, that you're the, the wise one and I'm the stupid one. So then the Lung Pa Chah was, I think, incredibly skillful in getting me to see what I was doing. Uh, <laughs> it took me a while, but it eventually got the point. Because uh, he, he wouldn't... Uh, go along with that scenario and uh, so I found that you know quite you know it it made me stand on my own two feet like I had to really look at myself rather than than worship this wise master you know so he wasn't going to let me just sit around and worship him you know he would would either make fun of me or make a joke or say something but you know you began to you know get the point of of uh, because I never felt you know even when he'd make fun of me I never felt it was coming from malice or cruelty it was just you know a kind of compassionate way of getting me to see the absurdity of my own delusions so uh, then, in uh, so I found those early years, even before I could understand uh, Thai that well, or uh, Isan dialect, that I did. You know, I could learn through this kind of awareness, and then these reflections we do in morning, evening puja, uh, you know, on on Buddha Dhamma Sangha. There, you know, they. They can be just perfunctory chants that you you're doing and thinking of something go or calling and thinking about something else, <laughs> or about, about present apparent here and now, like Santiti Kodama. It's not about the future, is it? It's not about tomorrow, apparent. You know, here and now, and then Akali Kodama is timeless. Ahi uh, Pratiko. You know, then you've got. Is it actually? You know, we translated it not in a nice, not a very good way. Encouraging investigation. It's more me like, wake up and see. You know, come and see. It's more like an invitation or even an imperative. Ehi, isn't it? Ehi biku. Ehi is more like come and see for yourself. And then uh, openaiko, uh, leading inward, or it leads on to. To uh, you know, a sustained awareness and and understanding that isn't conditioned through 
you know, doesn't depend on conditions, uh, special conditions. And then, budget tongue way teed up all in you here. So, you know, listening to Lung Po Cha, uh, even though, you know, I couldn't, you know, I was beginning to pick up the language and, the, and you'd hear these words being used constantly like, like, been budget tongue. So he'd think, budget tongue way teed up all in you here. That, we say to be experienced individually by the wise, but it's really, you know, you know for yourself. It's not, it's not second-hand information. It's not acquired knowledge from the scriptures or someone else. It, you have to know this. You know, like to taste honey, you have to taste it yourself <laughs> to know what it really, what its flavor is. And so. Uh, this is, these are the, you know, when we chant the uh, Buddha Dhamma Sangha. Well then, the, then the, the, the awakened, the Bhutan, the, the, the Buddha awakened attention. What is that? Here and now. Is it kind of like some abstract Buddha force out in the universe? Or is it, you know... You know, what, is there a, a, a Buddha nature that we conceive of that somehow you've got to get or you don't have or what is it? It's, and so like Bhutto or this, uh, the knowing and, and then like consciousness is, uh, you know, consider the reality of our situation having a, a separate form, for example, your own body a conscious form in a sensory world. So you you know you're beginning to see you we're kind of incarcerated. Consciousness operates through these these limited forms. Uh, so we you know we the form itself is very limited, but consciousness isn't limited. But we have to experience we experience consciousness through the form of, we have this limitation of experiencing it through this position of sitting, standing, walking, lying down. Well, you know, and the way you are, your karma, your vipaka karma, the, your own, uh, you know, karmic in, uh, heritage is like this. But consciousness is not created out of ignorance. But if you notice in Paticca Samupada, it if you're ignorant, if you start from ignorance, then of each abhijaya sankara. So that means that ignorance will create this illusion through all, you know, through the conditioned realm, which affects consciousness. So, you know, you've got vicha abhijaya sankara, sankara abhijaya vinyana, and then nama rupa, salyatana, pasa vedana, and then, uh, Dana Upatana Jati Jaramaranang Soka Parade. So it goes always from this general point of Avicha to and the result of Avicha is always Soka Paritewa or grief, sorrow, despair and anguish. So the thing is to see that it's not to start from Avicha is is uh, you know, gets you nowhere. You just end up with dukkha. So, how do you start with vicha, or you know, because then the neuroda side of paticca samuppada is significant. Because if there's mindfulness, then the whole process collapses, ceases, neuroda. So this mindfulness then is the is the very Essence of it. This is, you know, the escape hatch or the 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 way to liberation is is this simplicity. It's ultimately simple because it's not a compounded, refined condition. It's 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 its ability that we have as human individuals to pay attention to dhamma in the present. You know, out of pure out of knowing, not through personal attainment or identities of any sort. So it's, uh, that's why uh, over the years, you know, I found this 
this refuge in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, rather than just being perfunctory chants and Theravada ceremonial practices, it really, you know, you feel it. You know, every time I give the precepts to, to lay people, like Bhutan Sarananga Chami, you know, and this is something I'm giving of great significance. It's not just performing, a, you know, what you're supposed to do when people ask for the five precepts. <laughs> but you're actually, you know, uh, this is a powerful gift uh, and a reminder, you know, refuge in awareness, seeing, direct seeing, direct knowing, that isn't cluttered with ignorance and, and all the complications that come out of a vicha. So, so in the, uh, and then Dhamma is here and now, parent here and now, timeless. Uh, it's not some kind of precious, esoteric experience. It's just not, because out of a vicha, we don't, we aren't aware of reality. We're always operating from illusions, delusions that we cling to and identify with. And so, you know, it, it, and this is why the society is the way it is. Because it's, uh, you know, all our countries operate out of a vicha. <laughs> so it's, uh, you know, not, not one enlightened nation. <laughs> and <laughs> so, it, it's, uh, so this is why the world is the way it is. Uh, and so this is then you <clears throat> see that there's you know there's good karma and bad karma and so forth so that you you know on a worldly level you always encourage do good and refrain from doing bad sila uh, you know encouraging skillful action and and generosity so you've got dana and sila as a kind of general teaching in Buddhism, you know, whether it's bhavana then comes after that, but, you know, what you teach just little kids, little children in Thailand, isn't it? Dana, Sila is just kind of part of a cultural package. But it, what it does is it really, you know, even on a worldly level, it, it's uh, skillful to be generous, not to be just self-centered and obsessed with your own, you know, not being able to share anything and just be, uh, you know, obsessed with yourself and your possession, to be able to share is to be encouraged in every way. And then sila is is where you begin to, because uh, you know, lay people have to request, they, we can't go around saying you have to take the five precepts and compel them to take it. So you have these formulas like they ask for the precepts. Less significant is that even though it can be mere ceremonial, perfunctory ceremonies, it does have a point that we're not here to force people to keep more, to be moral and keep precepts, but to encourage. And then people do begin to see the Katsila has to come from not through fear of, of uh, you know, being punished, but through recognizing the the value of skillful actions and. The, the results of being, you know, of respecting others and other people's property and being responsible for how we live in the, in the society, even if we're not inter- interested in meditation. And then bhavana is, is uh, where, like, we're interested in bhavana, in trying to break through the realm of delusion rather than just find happiness and security in the, on the, in the world. So, so in this way, you know, the Buddhist spectrum is quite wonderful because it operates not through, you know, compelling or intimidating or, or scaring people, but through encouraging or generosity, right, skillful actions, and then, and then the bhavana into really penetrating into reality, beginning to awaken yourself through, through getting beyond just the cultural conditioning, the, the ego, or the social conditioning, and the, and the thinking process. 
and so the the um, and these these I found that like these morning evening chants over years you know suddenly they they began to you know they're everything's contained in that really everything you need to know and uh, and so it you know the so it, it just even memorizing rote memorization is very beneficial because it kind of sinks in your memory even though it may not mean very much to you but over the years it suddenly you begin to really you know you have these sudden insights oh this is what it really means you know what budget tongue may tease up over you know oh this is it you know <laughs> it's like you know ah oh. As an insight, uh, you know, even though you've been chatting that maybe for years, and you kind of know the definition of it, but to me, that insight is kind of this ah, this is it, you know, on a gut level rather than just uh, uh, from the defi- defined level according to scriptures or dictionaries. So these, like the, rather than starting from avicca, you know, this is a matter of learning to trust yourself more, not not your personality or ego, but you know, like we, like I was saying when I first stayed with Ajahn Chah, I, this this uh, you're the great teacher and I'm the ignorant student. So so then this was how you know the avicca that I started with. The e the Sakya Diti. And uh, and then Ajahn Chah kept making me look at that. He wasn't saying it was wrong, you know, that I shouldn't think that, but he you know, he didn't say, I'm not your teacher, you you got to just take responsibility for it. So he wasn't kind of browbeating me into trying to tell me that I you know I'm wrong, but there was this this, this lifestyle itself, this monastic lifestyle, is a is a skillful means of, of beginning to see through a lot of basic delusions we have about ourselves and the and the world and the people we live with. So then, uh, this is this is a wisdom teaching. <clears throat> so it's you know it is wisdom is not. Uh, you know, something that it's very easily found in the world of this time <laughs> is, you know, like the uh, idealism, say, of the, of the United States, very idealistic attitudes, you know, about democracy and, and uh, you know, the ideal form of government is democracy and human rights and gender equality and fairness and justice and progress and <clears throat> these are, you know, the, like the American values that, that I was raised with. So it's, and notice what are these, these are, you know, these are high-minded ideas. But it's not Dhamma, it's not the way it is. You know, so when we notice when you operate from ideals, where where does it take you? When you're always trying to become or hold on, grasp an ideal of how things should be, or how you should be, or how what Nanachat should be, or Ajahn Kavli should be, or, <laughs> or me, whatever is, you know, or we really, you know, can be very tyrannical towards ourselves, how, you know, I can't. I can create ideals of perfection, but I can't personally live up to them. <clears throat> so on that ego level, you, you know, you you you're constantly going to uh, find suffering as a result. You'll never be as good and as kind and as wise as you conceive you should be. But and so. That's not, it's not, it's through understanding the nature, like ideals or creations, that you, you know, we can create these ideals, and always the best, the very best, like democracy, where everybody's equal and 
everything's fair and pure justice and and kindness and compassion reign and uh, and there's no rich or poor I mean imagine <laughs> it can create the ideal like of, of communism you know where everything is is equal but in terms of the reality of Sankara's is Sankara's and there's nothing equal on that level it's all different and changing you know so you're you know just there's no, no condition exactly the same as another and because they're always in this process of change and so uh, and then the, what arises ceases so then the, you know, you begin to awaken to the reality of conditioned phenomena which is the body, your own body, your thoughts, memories, emotions, senses, sensory experiences, everything, you know, everything, like the trees, the new sala is eventually going to deteriorate. I'm sorry to disagree. <laughs> <laughs> like the one you ripped down the <laughs> <laughs> that I built <laughs> 30, 35 years ago. <laughs> but but uh, that's the way it is. You know, the condition phenomena has that. You know, the, that's its nature. And, and so that which is aware of conditioned phenomena is unconditioned you know a condition cannot know another condition so the very the reality of this moment is this knowing awareness of the breath is like this that which is aware of the breath inhaling like exhaling is is pure conscious awareness and then we say, you know, then we be complicated by say, my breath and things like that. But before that arises, before the me and mine, it's, it's inhaling like this. So there's an awareness of the breath. The breath can't see itself. You know, your in, in exhalation can't notice itself or or say anything about an inhalation. But there's a knowing uh, and the posture the body, and then this knowing awareness, kind of sati sampatanya, sati panya, aware like the four foundations of mindfulness: the body, the the feeling, the states of mind, and dhamma. You know, tamanus, pasna sati patana is uh, knowing dhamma. Things instead of seeing things in terms of conventional reality or conventional terms you're seeing you're knowing Dhamma the reality the the the, the universal re- reality of this moment which is you know when you try to conceive it it's impossible but it's, it's quite you know it seems impossible really from the thinking mind and from the ego level so, so that's where we we start of starting with a vicha, we start with just trusting this awareness it's like this. And so when I do this, then there's a sense of just attentiveness. It's not focused on any particular object at the moment. It's just a, a, a kind of wide open attention to the present is like this. And, uh, and of course, the conditioning is to always focus on something, to have look at this or you know, what should I do next? Should I do anapanasati or should I practice metta or should I <laughs> you know, so we have different ideas of what we should do. But this is where it takes much more kind of this sense of trusting yourself more to have this sense of awareness is just this and, and then the self arises in it. What should I do next? Should I practice metta or anapanasati? Is like this, you know. So you're 
you're beginning to feel more at ease with just being awareness itself rather than trying to become someone who's trying to become aware. It's quite subtle, but it, it's very simple, and, and so that, that's why it's overlooked, you know, because the, you know, in, in England, for example, people talk about the real world, and, you know, many times I've been accused of not living in the real world. People tend to think that in a monastery we aren't living in the real world, we live in an illusory world or an ivory tower or something. People have never lived there, of course. <laughs> and then, because the real world to most people is just the, you know, the, the material world and family and, and all the identities and, and ignorance and biases that operate through individuals. So, and then in the Buddhist teaching, the whole emphasis of being, the value of being a samana, a monastic, is that it is a vehicle, a kind of skillful means, expedient means, to 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 uh, encourage awakened attention to reality, to the present. So, so you know, this is what the value of this form is that it, it is a it is a vehicle to live in as a human individual with our individual karmic tendencies our, our vipaka kama that's all different from one to the next but but the um, and the vinaya is the way we agree you know how we're going to live together so it's not up for a kind of grabs you know we have to all agree to live within this structure these limitations that makes it possible to live together to be able to Awaken to reality, you know. So we're harmless. We're put in this, in this, uh, you know, the harmlessness of this form and the celibacy. We're not, you know, we're in, we're, we're not encouraged to seek uh, uh, or develop sexual tendencies or anything like this. So, so there's this kind of safety net of of uh, that we agree to voluntarily to live within. Uh, this conventional form, traditional form, and then the form itself is a convention. So it's for you know to help to encourage this awakened attention and live in a way that is in in the on the planet in the society that is not harmful or exploitive or or rejecting the society like. Uh, you know, going on Bindabar to uh, Bungwai and various villages, you know, you, you're connected, you're always connected to the lay community uh, uh, through necessity, through survival. And uh, so that's quite significant that we're not just hermits, you know, leave me alone and don't bother me, to where we, our relationship with the uh, Villagers with the with the people, the lay people is 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 a necessity. But our relationship then is not personal anymore, but through our you know through our cultivation of the path, because that's why we're worthy worthy of that generosity because of the intention and determination to cultivate this, and then of course that benefits you and, and the society, you can see how, you know, how a skillful effect a good monastery has on the villages and towns around it. So I'll stop now. <laughs>